Hi everyone, in this episode, I'm going to be talking about five factors that you need to be very careful with in buying in the middle of a boom, right? We are now. I see so many brand new investors, maybe experienced investors, make these mistakes and the boom masks their otherwise pretty terrible investment decision and they will only learn that it's terrible in a year's time, in two years time, in three years time. So if you're buying a property for the first, second, third, fourth time, you know, these four factors or five factors are essential for you not to be taken away with the herd, not to be swept away with FOMO and actually make a terrific property investment decision in the middle of this boom. And at the end of the episode, I'll share with you a location that actually stacks up. All right, so my name's PK and I help people build, well, I've helped hundreds of people and I help hundreds of people build passive income, obviously through property investing, using data without needing to drop $15,000 on a buyer's agent every single time. This channel exists to help you help you get ahead in Australian real estate. Okay, so I'm grateful for each and every one of you that are part of this community. If you like what you see, if you like what you hear, subscribe, please turn the notification bell on, give it a thumbs up if you genuinely get value from my videos and if you get value from this episode. <clears throat> All right, so let's get into it. The first factor that you need to be very, very careful with or very, very circumspect around is vacancy rates. Now, traditionally, you know, some people say, many property experts say that vacancy rates, you need to buy somewhere where a vacancy is less than 3%. I actually disagree with that. I like to be more conservative in our data. I like to be more pointed, more precise when it comes to selecting a suburb. I want vacancy rates to be less than 2%. Now, what you find in a in a boom, much like we're in right now, you know, like over the last 12 months, 96% of suburbs have increased in value. So, you know, a lot of people right now might be you are getting carried away thinking that you're about to make a fantastic decision or you have just made a fantastic property decision because the prices are rising. But, you know, in a rising tide, all ships rise. You know, the water level is rising. It's only when the tide goes out, when the boom goes out, then we'll start to see who is swimming naked. We'll start to see which ships were actually pretty terrible. And those are the ones that will capsize. Those are the ones that will fall in value. Those are the suburbs, the properties that will do terrible. So one way you can assess this is not only do we want vacancy rates to be less than 2% now, but we want to have seen that trend for a year, for two years, for three years. So before rushing out and, and making a decision and looking at data at a point in time, you really want to look at trends, okay? Each data factor, there's more than 30, 35 data factors. We'll be covering about five of them in this episode. Each factor has a particular shape or trend that we need to see. Some we review over the last three months, some we review over the last 12 months, some 36 months, some 10 years. Okay, each factor is different, but for vacancy rates, we really do need to see that we don't get swept away in the buzz of a booming property market. We need to see that that vacancy rate has been less than 2% consistently over the last you know, year, two years, three years. Otherwise, what happens is many markets like this at the moment, many suburbs where you'll see that maybe, you know, in 2019 or early last year, 2020, the vacancy rate was like 3%, right? And now it's 0.5%. And then you'd say, oh, look, you know, PK, it fits your system. It's less than 2%. But it can very easily or just as quickly go back up to 3% in the next one year or in the next two years, at which case or at which point you'll be scratching your head thinking, why aren't rents increasing? Why am I finding it so difficult to get tenants, right? It's a really, really important thing to look at trends. Okay, so that's the first factor. The second factor is renter proportion. You might have heard of this before, 
But effectively what renter proportion means <clears throat> is that in a suburb, so let's say there's 4,000 um, dwellings in a suburb, we don't want, you know, more than 40, more than 50% of these dwellings to be investment properties. There are many, many, many suburbs right now, especially in Brisbane. Like, I take a national view at the world, but um, especially in Brisbane and places like um, Browns Plains and that sort of, you know, there are some targeted good parts of the Logan City Council, but a majority is pretty terrible. And it's these parts of the world or in parts like um, Ipswich City Council where, you know, rent a proportion is really high. Now, what does that mean? That just means that more than 50 or more than 40 or more than even 60% of all houses, so one in two houses, are actually investment properties. Now, you might think, well, that just means that a lot of people want to invest there and that must be a good thing, right? Well, actually, it's not, because what that means is that in a booming market right now, yep, you might get away with it, but what happens is when this boom ends, and it will end, you know, booms don't typically last more than three or four years. We're about 12 months into this one. What will happen is that there will be so much fierce competition amongst landlords, about amongst property investors who already own property in that suburb, and so the tenants have ample choice, right? They have an abundance, a plethora of options that they can consider. What that in turn means is that rents don't really rise, okay? And it also means that vacancy rates will rise. So the first fact of vacancy rates and rental proportion is very much joint at the hip. Okay, you can see how this is kind of forming a story. If the rent proportion is very high, then even though right now rents might be rising, even though right now vacancy rates might be very low, if rent proportion is, let's say, 50%, and, you know, like Browns Plains in, in, in Logan City Council in Brisbane is a really good example of this, you know, it's a really high-risk investment decision because in two years' time, um, you know, you'll find that when your current tenant moves out, it might be really difficult to find a tenant, especially if you haven't followed the first piece of advice I gave on this episode and you've bought where vacancy rates are low now, but they traditionally haven't been. So if vacancy rates have come down from 3% to <clears throat> 1%, but in two years' time, they go back up to 3%, and the percent of renters or investment properties is like 60%, that just means, I mean, that's the perfect storm for those horror stories where you have like a six month vacancy. You don't want that, okay? So please don't be swept away with FOMO. Don't just buy in a suburb where in the last three months it's been rising in value or in the last six months it's been rising in value or in the last, I don't know, year it's been rising in value. It's these underlying data factors which are so so important okay number three factor is check the percentage growth okay so obviously we want to buy a suburb that's rising in value like that goes without saying obviously we want to time the bottom now it's you know, at least using my data methods, we can't get the bottom of the market, you know, to the exact percentage, you know, where it's just about to rise by 1%. We can't predict it to that level of accuracy. I don't think anyone can. I've, I've tried, trust me, I've run so many numbers, tried to do that. I can't predict that. But what we don't want to do is we don't want to buy in a suburb that has grown too much. Okay, and what that means, I don't want to put a figure on it. We, you know, this is what I teach my clients, but let's just pick a number like 40%. If you're buying in a suburb that has risen by 40%, let's say in the last year or 18 months or even two years, you on one hand might be telling yourself, well, this is a terrific suburb, you know, it's rising in value, everything must be fine, and that's why it's going up. Let me just jump on to this wave, let me get my board, let's ride this wave, you know, to the moon and back. Actually, what you're doing is putting yourself at massive risk because there is no suburb in Australia that continuously rises year after year, month after month in a linear fashion. They go up, 
and sometimes they go down a little bit or plateau for many many years or go down a lot and then they go up again and then they plateau for a while or come down a little bit and then they go up again now the extent to which that variation ha happens is dictated by supply and demand dictated by various factors but if you're going to be buying in a suburb that's let's say grown by 40% in the last year or two it's very, very, very unlikely. I don't care where it is, whether it's blue chip or not, whether it's cheap or expensive. I don't care about that stuff. I care about statistics. And there's something in statistics that call, that's called the theory of large numbers, or another way of saying that is regression to the mean. So over the long term, property prices, suburbs rise at about 6%, 7% per annum. So if you're picking a suburb that has predominantly or incredibly outperform that, then what you're telling yourself is that the future is going to be worse than the past. Because in the long term, 10, 20 years, there's something called regression to the mean. All suburbs, you know, end up being on average growing by about six or seven percent. Doesn't matter if it's capital city or regional, it's all very much the same. Look up the data. So if you're buying in a suburb that's grown huge not only are you not buying at the bottom of the market, but you're telling yourself that I'm purposely accepting potential underperformance in the future. Past growth is not a predictor of future growth. In fact, one better way to look at it, which is completely contradictory to what all the experts and pundits and everything that like that they tell you is actually the theory that I subscribe to, which is to say we want to be buying locations, we want to be buying suburbs that have underperformed in the past. Now just because they've underperformed in the past doesn't mean they'll outperform in the future because they just have to magically attain that 7% annual growth rate over the long term. So if they've only achieved 3% in the last three years, then they must achieve 9% in the next three years. Not just because of that, but we want to buy suburbs that have underperformed in the past, but also the data is now stacking up really well. So demand is starting to outstrip supply, and now there is huge business case for outperformance and regression to the mean. Okay, does that make sense? So don't buy it you know, in a suburb that's already grown by 40% or more. That's you know, somewhat hard to do and in the booming property market. You need to still find these suburbs that are relatively speaking at the bottom of the market. Okay, it's very important. And Tassie is a great example of this. So let me materialize or make this tangible. Tasmania has some terrific data, but it's a huge risk to buy in Tasmania now because almost everywhere has gone up between 50 and 100%. So the preceding 10 years, let's say year 2006 to year 2016, Tassie basically did nothing. I'm kind of just using round numbers there. And in the last four or five years, it did terrifically well. In fact, it's done so terrifically well that over the last 20 years, Tassie or Hobart, you could say, has outperformed Sydney. Real numbers, I'm not making that up. All right, Sydney's done about 5.8%, I think. Tassie's done 6.5% on average over that time period per year. So now what that regression to the mean theory tells us is that it's unlikely that Tasmania will continue to grow at double digits for the next few years. Okay, that's number three, it was a kind of a long spiel. Number four, and this is, this is something that people get wrong all the time, in the middle of this property boom, it's so easy to find the wrong suburb that will continue to do well over the next two or three years because of the COVID dynamic. You know, many regional towns, regional Victoria, regional New South Wales, um, places like that, um, where people in Sydney and people in Melbourne have migrated to regional areas, and these areas are doing really well. But in two or three or four years' time, when people come back to the office, it might happen even quicker, you know, policies change, people forget about COVID. I know it's hard to imagine, but it will happen. It's these areas, these locations, these suburbs that will do the worst, okay? It's these areas that will do the worst. And what that means is that they only rose in value because of the COVID dynamic. They only increased in value because people were fleeing, you know, buying these properties in regional Australia because now they can work remotely. 
But when they want to come back to the city, when they realize that actually they want opportunities for lifestyle entertainment, they want their kids to have that kind of big city life with all the activities and extracurricular activities that go with it, then these regional suburbs will really suffer. Okay, so one thing I really want you to understand and check, you know, job advertisements, for example, check whether the suburb that you're buying in, whether suburbs um, that you're looking at job advertisements were rising pre-COVID. If they've only been rising post-COVID because there's been regional booms or whatever the case may be, then that's a sign of a bit of a bubble in that specific location. You want to be assessing whether the data, not just vacancy rates, renter proportion, job ads, but there's 30, 35 data factors, whether they were lining up even before for COVID, so even before March 2020. And if they were, and COVID has simply accelerated that, that's completely fine. But if you see, you know, in various charts that we assess, like job ads, if job ads were, were flat, or even going down pre-March last year, but because of COVID, they've gone up, um, you know, with migration and all this sort of stuff going into regional areas, then that is the issue. That is a sign of a, a bit of a bubble, a, a bit of a something that could pop. Okay, so job ads is a really good way to assess that. Population movements are a really good way to ass assess that. Um, city plans or council plans, you can call the local council to understand what their plans are. Uh, building approval, so many factors that we look at, um, all quantitative, you know, you can assess to ass see whether the sub suburb is rising just because of COVID and you're buying at the top of the market in a property boom or whether it's sustainable, okay? And the fifth, um, the fifth factor that I, I really want to share with you is to check whether it's a suburb that is rising because of owner-occupier demand or investor demand, okay? Owner-occupier demand means first home buyers and upgraders. Is the majority of activity price growth, um, sales happening because of people buying their first home or upgrading, or is it because of investors? If you find that it's predominantly investor-led, then that is a thing to be concerned about because investors are often in the game of speculation. They shouldn't be, that's not what we want to be, but they often speculate. And that means that they'll invest in a location and then just as quickly, you know, when interest rates go up to 6% again or circumstances change or the heat comes out of the market, sentiment changes, investors who are speculating can pull their money out very quickly. Whereas if it was owner occupiers, upgraders that were buying in that location, they're sticky. They're what we call sticky. <clears throat> Stickiness just means that, you know, if you've bought your first home, it's very unlikely that you're going to sell it anytime soon. If you've upgraded your home, it's very unlikely that you're going to sell it at any moment in time. All right, you're kind of devoted to that. Even if interest rates go up, even if you, let's say, lose your job, the last thing you want to do is sell your house. Okay, whereas investors especially those who may have multiple properties, they can very easily liquidate their assets. And that means that supply increases, demand reduces, prices go down in that suburb. So in the suburb that you're looking at, if you're getting swept away by the heat of the market, if you're experiencing FOMO, I really want you to understand, you know, whether it's driven by owner occupiers or investors. If it's investors, it's a cause of concern. Now, I've done videos and I've done episodes before on how <clears throat> to date or till date, majority of suburbs around Australia, the rise, this property boom has been driven by owner occupiers, upgraders and, and first owned buyers, but that phenomenon is changing, it's pivoting, it's you know, migrating towards now more of investors. The investors have seen the light. Those who are educated already bought a year ago at the start of this year. The investors that were less educated, maybe that's you, I don't know, are now coming into the market. Now, there are still many, many, many areas that make fantastic buying. But what you're now also seeing, especially in capital cities, is investors are putting their money in and now the rises are driven not by owner occupiers, by 
but by investors. So that's hugely high risk. That's hugely, um, you know, it, it's it's a recipe for disaster. I'd say it's not it's not going to happen anytime soon. But in two years, three years, these are the types of locations. These are the types of suburbs that then experience that twenty twenty five percent correction, which is the last thing you want, right? I'm sure many of you who have experienced the last property boom, 2014, 15, 16, you know, you know what I'm talking about. In 17, 18, prices came down for some suburbs, you know, up as much as 30%. You don't want that to happen. All right, so those are the five factors. And I, I want I want to ask you the question, is there any, any other factors that you consider that you really analyze two times, three times before buying in a hot market? <clears throat> and tell me honestly, are you struggling to figure out where to buy in this hot market? If you are, leave a yes below. Tell me, are you struggling to buy in this hot market? Are you brand new? Are you still inexperienced and not really sure where to buy? If you are, leave a yes below and then that will give me the impetus to produce more episodes just like this so that I can bring you guys value. You know, guys, I really want to thank you for being here with me. Um, my name's PK and remember the most important real estate is the six inches between your ears so if you got value out of this video subscribe below don't forget to do that and below you'll also check out my free facebook group more than nine thousand members free strategies every day and also my podcast is linked below i just want to recap so check the vacancy rate history check the renter proportion percentage Check the percentage of growth and how it relates to the regression to the mean or the long-term average. Number four, check whether the data was stacking up even before COVID or is it a recent phenomenon. And lastly, check whether the drive or the price growth in a particular location is because of owner occupiers or investors don't get swept up with the FOMO I know everyone's making money in property you probably have friends and family who've made hundreds of thousands of dollars this year don't get swept up in the FOMO a rising tide lifts all ships some ships will continue to rise post boom as well and those are the suburbs we want but many ships will capsize when this boom goes out okay you don't want to be buying those locations. You don't want to be buying those suburbs. You don't want to be buying those properties. And hopefully these five factors and more, if you want more, keep leave a yes below. These five factors will help you avoid those mistakes, which you won't see to be a mistake until it's too late. Catch you later.